I mean, my uh, journey was was kind of wasn't the ideal for my for my kids. My mm-hmm. mother obviously d- uh, died mm-hmm. when my daughter was uh, pretty much eighteen months old. Mm-hmm. So I was a single parent with an eighteen month old and a three year old. That must have been hard as fuck, man. And running a business, <sighs> so I had its challenges. Um, but yeah, um, there's no such thing as. Tell me, how did you get through that? <laughs> Hey, what is up, everyone? We're back here with another podcast. Uh, I'm excited about this one. Today, we are talking shit uh, with my friend, client, amazing guy. I'm very excited about this conversation, actually. Uh, Tommy Sutherland. Tommy, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks, Paul. How are you doing? How are you really doing? Absolutely fantastic. (laughs) (laughs) So, Tommy is a guy that I met. Tommy, when did we start our little uh, rendezvous, our little... Just over two years ago. Just over two years ago. So Tommy came up to us two years ago. Um, and his transformation's been pretty fucking spectacular, actually. Every time I talk to Tommy, it's always an interesting conversation. We always have fun. Um, so I'm hoping to bring some inspiration, some excitement, some interesting stories, um, and a lot of fun uh, to your ears uh, today. So Tommy, just for the listeners, in your life right now, what do you got going on? I, a lot. A lot. A <laughs> lot. I keep myself busy for sure. Uh, in the business world, you know, own and operate a number of businesses from energy related to uh, property, to training companies. So uh, I've a mixed bag of stuff. Yeah. So you've got, how many companies have you got? Um, Six. Six companies. I mean, fucking hell, mate. Most people, a lot of people can't even get fucking started with one. What would you say then are the... Are the and I'm sure you're still fucking, there's a bit of making this up as you go along, part, which I love to do. What do you say are some of the keys then for managing that many companies without losing your shit? No question, time management's key. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's such a boring answer, isn't it? It is, it is. I mean, one of the things I've learned anyway is, uh, certainly something in your program, was uh, if you're trying to deal with multiple tasks and days, I mean, obviously, you know, you've got the tools, your outlook, your calendar, mm-hmm. but in terms of, your clean up days, your buffer days, things mm. like that. So time management, no question, is, is key. And not to be distracted from other businesses while you're working on existing business. Mm. So tell me, what does this look like for you then in practical terms? What is kind of, how do you do that? Like, What's your what's your time management kind of strategy, your philosophy? Like, how do you, because you, you know, we always hear that, like we know time management's key, but practically, what does that kind of look like for you? Um, like, how do you manage it? How I manage it? I mean, I don't ever... Uh, lose focus on my, my fitness mm-hmm. and my morning rituals. Mm-hmm. So a typical day for me starts um, as early as three o'clock, which is not ideal, but there is times <laughs> there anyway. That's the deal with the, the Far East. Yeah. Um, 3 a.m., holy it's, shit. It's, it's every so often, not every other yeah, day, yeah, every yeah, other yeah. week. But uh, every day I'm at the uh, the gym, mm-hmm. the box and a Mai Tai, 6.30. So mm-hmm. it's a 6 a.m. out the house, mm-hmm. do your workout, mm-hmm back home shower, and then uh, usually there's a call in from Asia before they finish off, and then you go to the Middle East, mm-hmm. and then it's uh, dealing with that, and then obviously you're in the US time zone as well. So uh, I, I would say I do put a 40 hour week in. I don't, not one of these guys is knocking in 60, 70. I just manage my time a bit more efficiently. Yeah. And uh, So I suppose then, what I heard there, Tommy, then is it's about actually not just time management, but also the things that you're doing within that time. Because what I heard there is a lot of leadership style stuff, really, not micromanaging people. Like, if you're running six companies, you're not fucking micromanaging people, right? No, not at all. I mean, you've really got a purpose when you're talking to people. Uh, I mean, you obviously want to become still personable with your staff and your management team, but uh, there's pretty much got to be a set agenda and time associated with it. It's just a pretty much... Knocking out the, the key points. I think that actually this one thing I've noticed about you is all of your conversations do have purpose. Like, you know what you want going into situations and conversations, right? No, for sure. I mean, I mean, selfishly, if I was in a situation when I was, uh, used the word havering for 45 minutes an hour. What was I'm, that word? Havering. 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 What's that word? Uh, <laughs> talking crap. Uh, just nonsense. Yeah, 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 yeah. Bullshit. Bullshit. Um, I'd rather use that time for me personally. Yeah. So if it means that uh, I could have an extra half hour in the 
the boxing gym mm-hmm. or sit in a sauna for an extra half an hour. Mm-hmm. I'd rather do that, yeah. selfishly. Yeah. But uh, it's getting back to the kind of key purpose and, uh, and just kind of knocking out what needs to be done in the business. Yeah. And you haven't always... We're going to get into the gnarly shit now. You haven't always been in control of all that shit, though, right? There have been times in that whole journey that have been a bit fucking bumpy, I bet. Oh, for sure. Um, Jesus. Um, yeah, a lot of... Uh, Ups and downs for sure, no question. Yeah. How did you get into started in business anyways? Have you always been in business or have you? Yeah, I mean, I first opened my first business when I was 23 years old. Oh, so like five years ago or something? Oh, it's my <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So you started your own business when you were how old? 25? 23. 23, and what was it? Um, it was electrical supply business. Mm-hmm. Um, started one in Scotland mm-hmm. and then started one in Houston. Mm-hmm. Um, so the one in what Scotland. was the, what was the, what was the jump from Scotland to Houston then? Well, I think you just go from Scotland to England, right? <laughs> no, well, I was fortunate enough. Um, the company I worked for at the time, anyway, they, um, they gave me the opportunity of, let's say, having a trip to the states yeah. um, just to fill in. Started with a six week secondment, and then mm-hmm. I came back, and they offered me two years. Yeah, and then from there, unfortunately, that business, that company, actually uh, went out of business, mm-hmm. and then. Uh, I was, me and my missus, um, she was training to be a nurse, yeah. and to cut a long story short, um, didn't want to go back to Scotland, mm-hmm. um, seeing an opportunity in the market, and pretty much start my business from scratch, uh, just working as an what agent. Was it about, what was it about being self-employed that kind of attracted you then? I guess the uh, the freedom. I mean, I, I felt that at the time... <laughs> it's mad that. It's freedom, mad that. Freedom's key, but equally as well, as I felt I wasn't really being uh, appreciated of what I was doing. Mm. Uh, I was working for somebody. I was knocking my pan in, mm-hmm. but I didn't feel at that time I was uh, getting awarded yeah. for my efforts, as you could say. So, Tommy, was there a certain amount of risk, if you like, then going from? Because yeah, it sounds like you had a pretty good fucking job. You had a pretty cushy. I can't believe I've just said that word, by the way. <laughs> fucking cushy. <laughs> Jesus Christ! Sorry, we just went back in time there. Yeah. <laughs> you had a pretty sweet number, and obviously taking it. It's quite a big jump, that in it. Huge. Huge. I mean, add to it the uh, your missus not having a job and mm-hmm. pregnant. Um, so and living yeah. in a fucking foreign country. Living in a foreign country, being you know, only time I've been to America, I think was was a kid and seen Disney World. So <laughs> to, to go over there and kind of commit to it, yeah. both of us were strange to it, and then have you know uh, a child on its way and moving a in a kind of solo position. So that I mean, I'm I speak to a lot of people about this, particularly on Instagram. I get a lot of questions about making that. Leap, right? And without saying just do it, <laughs> you're not allowed to say that. What are some of the things that you think you need to have in place? And if I'm going from being self-employed to to start my own thing, especially in that situation, like what are some of the what are some of the fucking nuggets or takeaways you can give the listeners on this one? I mean, to be honest with you, the biggest thing you've got to do anyway is make sure you've got. I mean, you've got all the desire, you've got all the work ethic that comes with the territory. But and you're in a position where you haven't any fucking option, right? I think that, do you know, like, you've got a kid on the way, you've got a missus not working, you've kind of got to make that work, right? You've got to make it work, but yeah. what makes it easier is make sure you've got some capital behind you. Okay. Uh, that so fuck your lot. money. Yeah, you need, you need fuck your money. Yeah. Um, money that you can, you know, lose in the event. Tell anyway. me, how do you know what that number is? What, the amount of money Yeah, like, the, do you know what I mean? Like, the capital behind you, like, is it a guess, is it? I mean, again, it goes back to back when I was that age. Anyway, I mean, I I, was, I couldn't read a balance sheet or a P and L. He was none the wiser. <laughs> I, mean, I, I still was, can't. I was just uh, <laughs> young and dumb, to be yeah. honest with you. Uh, yeah. f- you know, full of courage. Yeah. That was it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I thought you were going to say the classic young, dumb, and full of courage. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but we just found out your missus was pregnant. So there you go. There there you go. go. So we've got and the capital thing. Do you know the capital thing? I'm I, I'm. Very much like you, I'm terrible at answering this question. Like, I'm, I want to leave my job, my secure job. First of all, I don't think any job's secure these days. But I get this question so often. Like, I want to leave my secure job, but I'm scared of taking the risk. Like, I'm really bad at answering that question because I'm possibly a little bit like you. Like, I'm, I'm going to go balls deep on this thing. I think having a backup plan isn't always an amazing option, but it's probably a fucking smart option. Yeah, I th- another thing I would sh- share anyways is uh, we've always got a tendency to, to always look at the the upside. Mm. You know, a bit like, uh, you know, the kind of Del Boy scenario, and we're all going to be millionaires next yeah. year. 
Um, yeah. I think equally, certainly what I've learned is if you really look at the downside and position yourself there anyway, you're prepared for the downside. Yeah. And that can eliminate some of the risk factors. Dude, I love that. Like, because we always all think positive and it'll figure itself out. But I actually think both of those are dangerous, separate. Yeah. Like, if you only focus on the downside, you probably not do anything because you're too scared. Yeah. If you only focus on the upside, you'll probably make fucking ridiculous decisions. So I actually think that in the middle there, Dr. John Demartini would love anything like that because he's like, right, you need to, that will allow you to be neutral about it. Yeah. Almost unemotional. So you don't get too attached to the end yeah. result because you've weighed up the positive and the negatives and you found fucking neutral or objectivity. Like you can be more objective rather than fucking make emotional decisions. Absolutely. And yeah. I think equal as well. Another thing is, uh, which I've learned the hard way, is put a timeline to it. Mm. Um, I've, you know, I've made some um, decisions based on, I don't know, the, the desire to succeed, but it's not yeah. going to succeed. So it's putting a timeline to these things. So you yeah. say, you know, I'm going to knock us out next six months to a yeah. year rather than if it's not working you know maybe it's time to call it a day and move on to the next project yeah. or move on to yeah. a new business but yeah. last thing we do is kind of uh drag a business on just for based on the emotion attachment to it mm. Um, mm. so it's good to put some uh, timelines to it as well yeah and and how do you deal with because running that many businesses there must be quite a few fucking challenges I, i'm gonna throw this in Running that many businesses outside of time, what's the biggest challenge? Um, I'm really interested on your answer. I guess on this. The culture as well. So uh, people, people. That would have been my. That would have been my yeah. thing. Like I think business is easy until you start hiring people. Yeah, I mean <laughs> people for sure, and you've got a very diverse culture in my business. Because mm. um, they're from, you got people all over the world, right? Yeah, I mean in my office. I mean I'm a Scotsman. I'm, I'm and my headquarters is in Houston. Yeah. So I'm dealing with predominantly it's Hispanics that work for us mm. uh, in the office because it's it's highly populated by uh, yeah. Hispanics in Houston. Yeah. Um, and obviously you have got your native Houstonians. Yeah. Um, so there's a culture difference there. Yeah. Um, certainly with me from Scotland, and yeah. then obviously you're dealing with uh, Southeast Asia, um, where we've got you know, HQ for over there is in Singapore. Mm. So you're dealing with uh, Chinese, mm -hmm. uh, Singaporean Indians. And then obviously you're going to uh, Middle East and Abu Dhabi. Then you're yeah. dealing with uh, hell, mate. you're dealing with the uh, Indians and Pakistans. So what is your? How are you dealing? Like, what's your what's your strategy for this then? So if they're your biggest challenge, if that's your biggest challenge, the cultural thing, like, what do you? Well, it's, what do you do about it? Well, you have got to be mindful for them anyway in terms of the communications. Yeah, uh, and, and that can go right across from email mm. etiquette as well. So. Uh, when I say it as a challenge anyway, you've yeah. just got to be observant that uh, they're from a different part of the world than we are. And yeah. obviously cultural beliefs yeah. can become an obstacle yeah. uh, now and again. Yeah. But uh, that comes with time. I mean, uh, I've been very fortunate. And I've been submersed into that. And I lived in S Singapore for two trips. I did probably a good 12 years. Oh, shit, really? Yeah, I lived over there. Oh, wow. Uh, did a short stint in China. Yeah. Um, obviously, got businesses in Thailand, mm -hmm. India. So, you know, when you've been submersed into that type of business anyway, you've yeah. got to uh, kind of relate to the... Yeah, and adapt to the... You're a kind of adapting to the environment quite a lot as well, that right? environment. I mean, it's just... That's what I'm saying. You've got to adapt to the environment, their beliefs. Yeah. It's all key. That's yeah. a, a, a very important uh, ingredient for success is, yeah. is working with the, uh, the local cultures and accepting who they are. Yeah. What are some of the other challenges? Oh, um... We've obviously covered the uh, the capital at the early stages. Yeah. Uh, culture. Yeah. Um, how do you weigh up risk, Tommy? Because because every time you start one of their businesses, there's a risk. How there do I weigh be. up? Yeah. Well, like how do you? How I weighed it up before and how I weigh it up now is two different things. Oh really? I mean, I've I've as I equally said for every success story I can share, I've, I've had a, many a failure, and uh, and I cut. It's not through being mature in years. Mm. I think I've matured with damage. So I can look back and say, why the hell did I make that? And a lot of it was, uh, it wasn't even calculated intuition. It was just being, uh, I don't know, responsive. Yeah. Uh, not look, always looking at the upside and looking down the downside. Now, anyway, obviously everything's, uh, you know, I'm pretty fortunate now that, you know, you've got financial people within your organization you can rely on who kind of give things a, a diplomatic approach. Yeah, man. That's yeah, key. Yeah, that's yeah, key. yeah. And that's the upside of having people, right? That's some of them are yeah. smarter than you with yeah. certain things. They look at things in a total different way I would. 
Mm. Uh, and you need that in any kind of successful corporation if you're that level that if I'd wish I'd put I had a, a stronger finance team several years ago yeah um but you know the last six years we've uh, we've had people in place anyway kind of give you a very very uh, diplomatic view I love this good. concept you know Tommy because I, I speak with a lot of people and work with a lot of people who are like oh my wife's so negative and my partner's Get my husband's th- thrown up all these downsides. I'm like, well, that's not a bad thing. Do you know what I mean? We're like, oh, they're unsupportive of this, they're unsupportive of that. I'm like, no, they are just showing you the downsides that you haven't seen yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I think that's important. I think so often, like, especially business people and entrepreneurs, we get, we do get carried away. Like, we get carried away with the excitement and the positives and the upsides and the potential payoffs. That actually we do make ridiculous decisions, and we I think actually we get a little bit deluded, right? And I bet Absolutely. you were like that in your early days. Oh no question, no question. I mean, uh, no. Anyway, I, I kind of look at things like the what if scenario, but clearly maybe it was just an age and experience. Mm. We're always looking at the the upside, Never like overexcited, at overexcited. Yeah. Like the passion was there, the yeah. drive was there, the spirit was there. Yeah, but uh, never really had the early days. Somebody turn around and say, this is stupid. I, and that's so amazing because everyone thinks that's bad. Oh, they're trying to hold me back. I'm like, no, they're just, they're not trying to hold you back. They're showing you the downsides, which I think we all need to see. Yeah, I mean... Um, and I, we were mad I would take that shit personally, innit? Yeah, I mean, I don't. I mean, I had a, a conversation, believe it or not, just before I left and asked uh, two key members of staff. One of them was with me for uh, 20 years. And I said to her, I goes, uh, of all the good and the bad I've done, you've worked with me for this 20 years, what would you say one of the worst things that you've done in terms of the mistakes I made in business and it was impulsive decisions wow uh, and I went okay impulsive never actually you know th- thought them through yeah it looked at the upside and that was it so yeah. was, okay so it was it's interesting to hear somebody who's been working with me for 20 years and kind of feels comfortable enough to tell you that yeah you screwed up on the way and yeah. this is the reason you screwed up so yeah lessons learned from that yeah it was the uh was there a did you ask her what the best decisions you made in your business were I guess the best decision, I'm obviously like every other business, which which hurt with uh, the COVID and a downturn. Yeah. I guess just over two years ago, um, I really had to clean house. Mm. Uh, a lot of layoffs. Yeah. And, uh, and it was 48 layoffs I did. So from there anyway. That Tell me, how do you, I, I want to stay on this for a second. How do you deal with, because I, I bet that wasn't easy. Oh, it was horrible. Yeah. That's it. Telling someone that I haven't got a job. How do you deal with that then? Like, because there's got to be, and again, this could relate to any situation. There's got to be a bit of guilt with that, right? Do you f- like, how do you how do you process that? You never get used to doing it. Yeah, um, it's something that uh, I would avoid at all matters. That was the the hardest one. Was two years ago. Yeah, there was not one person who worked in that company deserved to lose their job. Yeah, so that was the hard thing. And then you got to be. Yeah, they weren't losing the job because of something that they'd done wrong or. Yeah. Yeah. So that was that was tough, and obviously, uh, you know, for everyone that you uh, you employ, you got to be mindful of the fact that you know, most of them have families as well. Like, no, mm. um, you're going through a pandemic, but it was no different from from any other companies had to yeah. go through those hardships. But yeah. didn't make it easier. Yeah. I mean, uh, doing it one by one. I mean, it was uh, c- c- crush crushing the soul. That yeah. One. Yeah. So uh, how did you stay on top of that? I almost want to say, how did you, st- how did you feel okay with it? Felt terrible. Yeah. Um. No, I didn't feel good at all. I mean, yeah. I just had to knock it out one yeah. by one yeah. over the course. Of and then come out on the other side, obviously. On the other side. Yeah. Um, did it from the house. And my uh, the thing that kind of gave me the, the desire, I'm sorry, what's the best way to describe it, it gave me the, the strength was my baby daughter. Mm-hmm. So when I was doing all this, she was just pretty much, you know, learning to crawl. Yeah. So that kind of gave me a lot of comfort, you know, yeah. anyway. It kind of it gave me the desire and push. Probably some perspective as well. It did. I mean, just simple things, which I've got some uh, pictures and milestones there anyway with her. Yeah. Um, which, no, it kind of puts it in perspective. Tell me, when you're moving at this kind of pace then, how do you, what are some of the tools you've got for staying, I hate using this word, but how do you stay motivated? How do you stay hungry? How do you stay... Do you know what I'm saying? Because you're in that position now and you're like, it would be quite easily to kind of rest on your laurels and just be like, oh, well, I've kind of made it, if you like. Like, how do you how do you stay hungry? Hungry. Um, stay humble. That's important. Um, I guess my DNA, I guess I'm maybe wired differently than most. And I think uh, most entrepreneurs are, man. Yeah. 
So what do I get kicks out with? Probably mental and physical challenges. Uh, and that keeps me motivated. Yeah. So, and then... So you the thrive in challenge. So if I overcome those things, then... You I'm thrive on... Th are you one of these people then? Because I'm a bit like this. Thrive, you, you do better when things are harder. Uh, I wouldn't say that. I guess the best way to describe it is, like any entrepreneur, or while you're entering into that type of world, as you could say, there's a lot of doubters. There's a lot of people kind of question if you're going to make it or not anyway yeah. so yeah um i guess that self-belief anyway is that you want to make a success so you're always proven to yourself and mm. others that you can be successful yeah so there's a, there's a little bit of all these guys are talking shit these guys want me to fail so fuck it i'm gonna oh yeah i mean that's yeah. it i mean there's uh, a lot of that in, in business as you yeah. all know anyway yeah um before it used to bother me but now i don't really care anymore yeah and you're on mission on how far mission. ahead do you plan tommy like how far ahead are you is your is your vision what, as far as as far as business and your personal life, like how do you have a do you have a vision? Do you have a strategy? Do you have like people talk about ten year plan? Do you have that or? Well, I mean, I've been through that. I mean, ten year plans. Yeah, I can't. Do you know why I don't have that? You, I don't have that because I can't remember what I was doing ten years ago. So why the fuck would I try and predict what I'm going to be doing in ten years? I, I think uh, in, in the business world, people say like three year plans, but notably anyway, I'm. I've got, uh, I know what we're doing this year. We're going to fall out with all the business at the end of this year. Yeah. We have a plan for following you. Yeah. And I think that certainly sits well with me. Yeah. Um, you know, where we're at, we're at like an 18 month plan. Yeah. But uh, as we've all experienced, I mean, the pandemic. It has to be fucking flexible. And it's got to be flexible. Uh, and then obviously, uh, one of my major businesses was in the uh, oil and gas. And that obviously took <sighs> a hammer in. Like, so for every high, there was a low. Yeah. So, and you can't legislate for. Stuff like that. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, you, again, it's going back to some of the simple formulas. There, anyway, is when you've got capital investment, and you've got your balance sheet, and if you've got borrowing from a bank, if you can actually do the simple maths and say, what am I left with, or what am I going to owe back? If the worst scenario that this business is yes. on its knees, um, and that allows you to make logical decisions yeah, and logical smart decisions. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, a lot, a lot more people are a bit more cautious now in terms of some of the growth strategies, just because of uh, obviously what happened with the pandemic and yeah. stuff. Yeah, and people are worried about this cost of living shit. And oh yeah, I mean, it's just who would have thought we'd be uh, at that position? You know, mad. T two years ago, it's just been ongoing, is it? Dude, you know, <laughs> I should have done my research on this fucking car that I've just bought. I walked here this morning, but this car that I've just bought, feel it, our engine. And before, when people, you know, when people are talking about the cost of petrol and that, I'm like. I don't know anything about it, but fucking hell, this car, fuck me, I, f I must fill it up fucking three times a week. It's fucking insane. Anyway, I digress. Tommy, what's your mindset around money then? Because I think this is the type of thing that people don't like talking about and the type of thing that people normally, but we've talked about balance sheets and, and predictions and that. Like, what, what are some of your mindsets around money? Because are you from a family that's entrepreneurs or... Father is. Oh, is he? Yeah, father is. Uh, he started from scratch. Yeah. Uh, basically next to nothing. So uh, What did he do? Electrician. Oh, really? Yeah, he electrician. He used to work in the fish boats, and then later then he worked in the uh, uh, paper mills. Yeah. And then from there, he uh, started doing flats, and he's been a very successful uh, property man in Aberdeen. Mm -hmm. So I guess chip off the old block from him. Yeah. Um, but equally as well as... Again, very humble man. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I got probably yeah. some of it from. And what is your what is your? So you've got some of your entrepreneurial spirit from there, definitely. I don't know where mine comes from because no one in my family is self-employed. So you've got some of your entrepreneurial spirit um, from your dad. But what are some of the? Do you think you have to have different beliefs around money when you're self-employed? Um, I guess. My motivating factor is I've got three children. Yeah. And despite how old they are, yeah. uh, I'm always mindful that you want to give them the best. Yeah. And you could arguably say you could be spoiling them. Yeah, yeah, But yeah. you want to be in a position where... I'm always worried about you're, that. You worry about your daughter when she's going to get married, a car, yeah. their grandkids. So yeah. that stuff has been my driving factor. And now yeah. I've got a, you know, a three-year-old as well. Like, yeah. So a big difference. So yeah. that itself, at my age, having a baby... Uh, that also gives me yeah. a kind of a drive. Yeah, you're doing it all over again. Doing it all over again. Yeah, I love it. Um, so let's talk about some of these other businesses then. So we've got oil and gas. We've got 
You still doing the electoral supply, right? Yeah. Yeah. What else have we got? Um, we've got a, well, a training business, mm -hmm. which is predominantly in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. um, it's electrical skills training. So yeah. So that's ongoing. How do these, how are these, um, I'm just fucking totally through in another question here. How do these different, are you coming up with all these business ideas or is it a natural evolution or is it, just think about that because you move from like one business to six businesses is no fucking joke. I mean, arguably the ones which we're talking about now, the, the kind of the space when it comes to the service and the supply chain, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's kind of. They're energy, all quite linked. Energy mix. Yeah. Most part. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, we've now diverse into doing work, believe it or not, for uh, Blue Origin. You know, the space shuttle. Yeah, yeah, program, yeah, yeah. Which is which is great. Um, uh, tequila distillery in Mexico. You know, stuff Mate, like this that. is mad. You know, I had a conversation with my uh, manager last year, and there was a uh, the the discount. This is when I was drinking last year. There were um, there's a company, Patron. Yeah. Make the tequila, and there's a there's a drink that I uh, I don't know if I still love it or not. But last year I loved it called Cafe Patron. And they've discontinued it, right? This this is a this was a thing where the sales were going up year on year, like double and year on year cafe patron. It's like a tequila and coffee liqueur. Yeah. It's fucking delicious. And he said he knows someone in Bacardi who own Patron and they they discontinued they've sort of discontinued this product despite it being so profitable because they don't want they want to be like a premium brand mm -hmm. and they don't want this coffee mix being the first thing that people experience. And apparently the supply of Tequila can't keep up with the demand. Uh -huh. Apparently, if you're buying, he was like, oh, if you can, Paul, you should buy. If, apparently, they can't buy, comes from like cactus or something, doesn't it, yeah, tequila? Yeah. Apparently, they can't buy these cactus or these aloe vera plants fast enough. Oh, well. That's mad, isn't it? It's mad. Yeah, it is mad. So, <laughs> we've got electrical supply, tequila. <laughs> uh, electrical supply. Tommy, does this is this was one of the first things that popped up in my head when we said six. Does six times the businesses... Equals six times the more stress, or does it not? No, no. I mean, I'm I've learned as well over the course of years is that well, if you've got a diverse portfolio of businesses, then obviously you've got passive income in from different businesses. It's all highly reliant on the energy sector, which I learned the hard way with its ups and downs. Yeah. So you know, we've got uh, a, a training business which is pr predominantly franchised out. Yeah. And then obviously, in addition to that. We've got the uh, the property business, mm -hmm. so the holding company, we've got rental properties, mm -hmm. and then we've started doing uh, building luxury homes. Yeah. So we're kind of facilitating different other people. Yeah. So you've got the low income housing to yeah. the top end housing as well. Yeah. And and obviously, then obviously you've got the supply chain management business, the training. So there's different um, income streams yeah. from different sectors. Yeah. How do you know then? Like where to spend your time, like because I'm like I've got you've got all these six companies, you've got all these people. How do you know? Because we talked about time management right at the start. Like, how do you know where to put your attention? But like, how do you not? Because that's a lot of plates as well. You've uh, you've got to look at what's going to be the most profitable, and and time. Um, if you're and I don't, you know what? That I love that honesty, mate. You've got to look at be what, what what's going to be the most profitable. I look at that as well. I mean, what's going to be the most profitable for the least I'll, amount of time? I've seen a lot of people um, working on stuff because there's a passion associated. I mean, passion's good. Yeah. But passion doesn't necessarily pay the bills. <laughs> I agree. So, um, I agree. you got to kind of keep the emotions out of it. Yeah. And just look at it and from a from a business standpoint. Is, yeah. uh, where am I suppose it's about knowing the numbers as well. And I think this, honestly, it blows my mind how many people just don't know their fucking numbers. Here's the truth, though. I'll throw in this little bit of truth. I wouldn't know all of my numbers unless I had somebody shown me them. I think too often we try and do it all ourselves, right? I think, uh, and obviously when you're first starting out and there's just you, there has to be an element of that. But I'm like, you wouldn't know all your numbers off by heart. You, you've you got a solid team around you showing those numbers, right? Yeah, I mean, the key to success is, is two things. It's people and process. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, arguably without that, then you're setting yourself up. For Mate, it was going to be my next question, this. It's a shit question, this, but how important are the people that you have around you? A hundred percent. Yeah. No question. I mean, I'm uh, been very fortunate of a uh, solid group mm -hmm. of people who I work with, mm -hmm. and uh, the culture's great. Yeah. And uh, 
there's no way I would be successful. It wasn't for them. So. I've just uh, that was honestly, mate. That was one of the worst questions I've ever asked. How important are the people? Because everyone listening in are going to know how important it is. How do you find the people? How do I find them? Yeah. How do you find these? So we know how important it is to find good people and be surrounded by these people and have good energy and good attitudes. Like, how do you find them? Recently, we've been recruiting people, the kind of younger generation, which I feel in this day and age anyway, which I, which I need personally because uh, I'm going to call myself a dinosaur. <laughs> but uh, in terms of how business is, <laughs> is done, in terms of, you know, the uh, social media platforms. Yeah, technology. Like that, technology yeah. and that. So a blend of, uh, of youth and yeah. experience is yeah. key. Yeah. So uh, we do recruit at uh, university. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so a lot of these people, it's their first job. Well, their well, first well, job yeah, post university. There's a couple of them there anyway. Um, yeah. The core group of people I've had two, it's been with me for uh, 20 odd years. Oh, really? And sure. They came with me from. Mate, you must be doing something right to keep them for that long. Yeah, I've been fortunate that way anyway. So uh, I think next year, actually, coming up to their. Uh, one's 22, another one's 20. That's fucking insane. So let's talk about that. The second piece of that, then, like, how do you keep these people? Well, because you guess said fortunate, but I, I don't mean, believe you. You have to um, note their the self worth. I mean, there's a, there's a journey that uh, they've came on me with, so um, you know, you've got to compensate them well, and uh, you do appreciate them, and you've got to be mindful that they've also got families as yeah. well. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I think it's that the question or the answer you're looking for. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Like, how do you keep these people? And you, you, you answered it perfectly, mate. So so I talked about stress before, the stress of running six businesses. I want to spend a little bit longer there. And you kind of already mentioned a little bit about what you're doing at the start. Like, how do you stay on top of, like, what are you doing that deals with this concept of getting stressed? Like, you must be doing something. You must have some tools, some techniques and strategies that you're doing daily, weekly, monthly to not, get fucking sucked into stress. Yeah, I mean, it, I guess it's taking time. And uh, I guess morning rituals is key. Mm. I mean, uh, that that's key. And it was certainly key for me. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, you hear the old days that people being entrepreneurs and only need three, four hours sleep. That's yeah. just nonsense. Yeah. Uh, getting a solid night's sleep is yeah. key. And uh, are you using, are you do, are you, Have you got any hacks for getting a good night's sleep? Take a bit of melatonin. Is that, oh, you guys have that over there, don't you? Yeah, it yeah. works wonders for me, like, but other than that, but, uh, you know, just, uh, what's the best way to describe it? Peaceful music drifts me off, yeah. and, uh, you know, a decent night's sleep's key, morning rituals for sure, yeah. and then uh, just, just having a, uh, a kind of routine and schedule was key. I think you can go off a on routine. a tangent, uh, you know, if you don't have that type of routine in there. Yeah. I, I'm a sucker for routine now. Yeah. If I don't stick to it, then all bad shit can happen. Yeah. So you have like all you 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 kind of there's some organisation within the chaos. Oh yeah, I've got to be. I mean, I'm triggered. I've got uh, in my calendar. Um, it's pretty much marked down. Pretty much every thirty minute increments there anyway. Do you know? I was actually talking about this this morning, mate. I think I think a daily to do list. I was saying actually, most people don't even have a to do list in their life. And then I think the next level up is start working from a to-do list. And I think the next level up there is daily planning and then weekly planning and then monthly planning. But I actually think the higher up the levels of success, if you like, even if it's that that's not in just business, but I think the higher up the levels of success you want, I think the further ahead you've got to plan and schedule, right? Oh, for sure. I mean, technology has its, uh, its positives, but also has its negatives. I mean, we now... You've got Calendar, which we use as a as a as a business as, yeah. as an individual. Yeah, people can book you in if you don't block it off. You're booked in for uh, the next couple of weeks. I mean, when I leave here anyway, <laughs> and so then you've got to and then you've got to tell them, "Oh, I can't do it now." Exactly. Yeah, so it has its pros. But and But that's cons. why I don't use it. <laughs> <laughs> it has its pros and cons. So, yeah. uh, and and that's it. So you have to be more. You have to be organised in this day and age. Anyway. Yeah, and it's a funny thing, you know, because I was also. I, I would say that's one of the biggest changes I made this year was in January. I still remember it quite clearly. My wife Leslie forced me to plan in the rest of my year, so I was like, I was like a monthly planner maybe, but I kept getting, I keep getting, st- I've always got stuck at certain areas in my life, and I was like, actually, what if I just plan the year out further ahead? Yeah. Because if we think about this, when I get guys in here and girls in here and ladies in here, and we're looking at, um, we're looking at um, the difference between the goals that we made happen and the goals that we didn't. One of the most common denominators is. You had a plan and you scheduled in those things and you didn't with those things. It's a mad thing, that, isn't it? It's so common. But I was saying this morning that 
it looks like, and I think one of the reasons we don't plan is because it feels like we're a bit restricted, if you like. It feels a little bit constricting, yeah. a little bit controlling. But I'm like, well, actually, it's the opposite, right? Like, I get to have freedom because I have such a... Is that weird? Is that a, do you get that as well? Do you feel like that? Um... I mean, like, because people, if I show people my schedule, they're like, oh, Paul, that must be overwhelming and it must be, you must feel restricted and you must feel, it looks a little bit too jammed and busy, but it's... I, I guess you look at the, I always look at the upside. So if, if, you're, if you're not in your pan in for the next two weeks or yeah. three months or so, and you've got something positive planned, like a holiday or something like that, then it makes it all worthwhile, well, I'm it? like, I'm like, I'll show you my plan, but there's nothing in there that I don't really like doing. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like if I want to do nice things and do things that I like and run a business where I'm mainly 90% of the time I'm doing things that fascinate me and motivate me, then I've got a plan to make that happen and schedule to make that happen. It's a funny thing. But I think that, and I, heard, I can't remember where I heard this, but I love it. The reason that we don't like making plans and schedules is because it feels like we're setting the parameters to fail. Well, I guess you, to some degree you're losing your entrepreneurial spirit. That's maybe what you think that anyway. Mm. So that's what we kind of shine. Yeah, you, like you lose your ability to like life surf and yeah. yeah. If you've got it too structured, then anyway, you might come up with a creative idea. And if your calendar restricts you not to have a creative idea, and what makes do you an know, entrepreneur? Do you know, Tommy? That's a that's a great point because one of the challenges that I have sometimes, and you've, I, I, I think you will have certainly felt this is sometimes when I'm kind of changing hats in the day. Mm -hmm. So I'll go from being a, a, a leader of my team to coaching, to then teaching something to do with business, to then performing on a podcast, to then having to rehearse for my show. Like for me, the, those all feel like different hats and that's one of the biggest challenges that I have. Like where I'm doing different tasks for different businesses and do you get that or? Yeah, but I mean, the only way I can recommend, certainly works for me, is uh, when you're, putting on so many hats you've mm. got to have thinking time in between in between yeah. no question yeah um try and if you're changing hats try and limit the amount of hats you're changing throughout the day yeah if you can focus on you know if it's a, a topic or a business then mm. you know focus on it for that day is that what you it. do are you like is that how you navigate each business do you like have well this time and this time i work on this business and then is that how your thing works or yeah i mean the most part there anyway there, there is structure to it mm. um and yeah for sure and then obviously throughout the day anyway i've got we'll call it you know we call it buffer day yeah where you just kind of clean up uh on various other tasks that need to be done but yeah it's pretty much set up per business yeah over a, a period of time maybe the whole day but it's a sufficient uh, blocked yeah. out time yeah, that yeah, I can yeah, focus yeah. on that yeah. truly. If not, I got distracted yeah. and I'm not giving that business the attention it deserves. And what do you do then, Tommy, when, because I get asked this fairly often as well, and I'd love to hear your insight on this. What do you do when things come in that weren't on your schedule? So like, let's just say you've got these blocks all blocked out. Like what happens if something comes in where you're like, shit, yeah, this needs dealt with right now. Like what's your... What's your whole... Well, it's, it's sense, of, sense of priority. Uh, if it needs my attention, then, yeah, things will have to stop. But mm. um, if you've got a solid team behind you, obviously you, you want people to, you know, you can delegate to them to take care of that stuff. Yeah. And, yeah, I get it. My team, this is what my team are great at. They'll pick up the slack. So this week they've looked at my schedule for the next two weeks and been like, holy fucking shit, Paul. Like, they, their first reaction is, what can I take off your plate? What can I help with? What do I need to put? What do I need to handle? What I mean, it's more me car insurance. Cats handing me car insurance. Do you know what I mean? It's like little shit yeah. like that. And I think yeah. that's it. How do you let go then, Tommy? Because at your level, you have to be fucking world class at this. Letting go of like, you probably had to let go of quite a lot of control, right? For sure. Yeah. For sure. I mean, that, that took time. I mean... Because uh, at the start, you were probably the guy that was buying the fucking bits and sending them out yeah, and shit. I mean, yeah, I mean, there was that. I'm learning. There was certainly a degree of micromanagement on my mm. side back there anyway. But now... Um, it's pretty much you're on the business, but not in the business. Yeah. And I feel that uh, being a bit more, we use the word thinking time, mm -hmm. and uh, being a bit more strategic. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I call myself, I don't call myself CEO anymore, I call myself the visionary officer. Yeah, oh, come on, Tommy! <laughs> So it's it's that it's reminds us of them guys that make sandwiches in Subway. <laughs> Do you know the, what they called again? Sandwich technicians or something? Yeah. I think they are, aren't they? I'm sure they're called the Subway guys are called sandwich technician. Did you know? Here's a random fact for you. Me and Nina love watching random TV shows and watch something about Subway. Subway has more franchises than McDonald's. Oh, wow. How mad is that? 
Subway has, and it makes more money. Really? It blew me head off. Aye. How many sandwiches they make, how many, aye. they reckon McDonald's stole their idea of customising burgers and that, because okay. McDonald's, McDonald's ain't even fast food anymore, it takes fucking ages. Yeah, yeah, you ever yeah, noticed yeah. that? Well, it's the name of my uh, food of choice. <laughs> <laughs> Me might need that, honestly. But this Subway thing blew me head off. Where'd I get that from? Sandwich technician. So you're the visionary... Visionary officer. Yeah. So, yeah. So having that time mm. to kind of think, as you say. Think yeah. And are think. you planning that time in then? Yeah. 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 I mean, I'd, it works for different people. But, I mean, I might take out uh, a time and just, depending obviously where I'm at and the weather and the heat, is just going out of the office and, and walking three miles and having that 40 minutes of thinking time. You're fucking melting there. <laughs> You're melting. <laughs> You melt in Texas if you <laughs> walk out that heat. Yeah. So it's a walk. So and yeah, and, and that kind of gives me a bit more clarity and stuff. Gets me out of an office environment. I feel I can be uh, a bit more strategic when I put myself in a different environment mm. opposed to being stuck in an office. Mm. And I guess it's just uh, taking notes of those thoughts, which I think it's key because we can always have great ideas, but then sometimes we forget about it. Yeah. So it goes back to journaling. How do you do that? Are you on pen and paper? Pen and paper, yeah. Fucking come on. Yeah, I've got uh, little notepads there. I think I've got about six or seven. Of Have you? And then I just, do I'm the same. I put them in the back of my jeans, yeah. put them in my joggers, and then if I've got a thought, I can write it down. I can keep it. Yeah. Um, have you, do you ever wash the joggers and find your fucking wrap the whole door inside? <laughs> I know, I've been smarter than that. I now take pictures of the most important things as well. But That's no, it, but yeah. Behind it's it, a funny thing, and then handwriting's a funny thing, because there's so many people don't do it anymore. But I love it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I guess, I mean, it's, I'm old school when it comes to stuff like that. I don't think I am old school, but I must be. Yeah, I mean, it's good to reflect back on it as well. There's, you know, something there anyway. Um, and it just put down a date and a time and a thought, and then you might come back to it. You know, a couple of days a week later. Anyway. I think why I love pen and paper so much sometimes is because I can't get distracted. I can go on my phone. So, for example, in the morning, so I get weighed every day so I can have an average. And sometimes I get weighed and I open up my fitness pal or one of the apps I'm using to pump your weight in. Fucking 20 minutes later, I still haven't done it. Yeah, Do you know, because there's been, there's just been pings or I'm nice. like, I, I go, sometimes I'm like, why am I on here again? Yeah, It's mad that, isn't it? I think that's one of the great things about pen and paper. No question, no question. Yeah, I, mean, I think people have great difficulty reading my uh, my handwriting, but it I mean, works I'm, for me. <laughs> there's some times when I'm fucking glad of that if I've rolled something down. I'm like, well, it's only me that can read it. That's sometimes it. I can't even read yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talking about pockets, Tommy. Random one that's gotten... Yesterday, I put on a pair of jeans and there was a fucking tooth in the pocket. Oh, nice. My son's tooth. I can't even remember, he said it happened in Disneyland, which the concerning thing is that was in fucking February. So I've got no idea. Do you know that pocket? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I was younger, the little pocket that used to keep your coke in, your bag <laughs> in. Do you know which one I mean? I've never found out what that, do you know what that pocket's for? Fucking no idea. It's I don't purpose, know what it's it? for either. Do you know which one I mean? I don't know, put in there. I mean, to this day, they still design jeans with that they little They do, don't anyway, they? Quite figure it out. That's a... I'm going to have to Google that. You have to Google and find in fact, it. But I think equal as well. I think you need to get uh, your son some money for the tooth fairy. <laughs> <laughs> this fuck has 11. He hasn't believed in Santa since he was eight. The challenge that I've had with it is I'm like, I, I've got no argument. He's so logical that I can't, I haven't got any comeback to anything that he says. Fuck. The other day he was arguing about, so Leslie was away in London at Strategic Coach actually Thursday, learning about buffer days and free days, right? So he comes downstairs and I'm making the pat lunch, right? And he's going, dad, I want grated cheese, not sliced cheese. And I'm like, mate, that's a fuck on, isn't it? I'm like, I'm in a hurry. It's the morning. Got to get them to school. I'm like, mate, can you not just have sliced cheese? And he said, well, grated cheese is better. And I had zero comeback. Because it is, isn't it? It is. Grated cheese is way better than sliced cheese. Just smart ass like his dad. <laughs> it's just logical. He's just logical as fuck. And you'll go like, if Santa's real and Santa makes all the toys, how come sh toys are in the shops all year round? I've got no logical, I can't lie my way out of that, can oh, I? Seems to be smart. Eh? <laughs> it's, it's, ah, but then he's thick as fuck about some things. It's, my, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a strange thing. Parenthood. Yeah. What are some of the biggest lessons you've learned about being a dad? Because there's such a big age gap between your kids, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, my uh, journey was, was kind of, wasn't the ideal for my, for my kids. My mm -hmm. mother obviously uh, died mm -hmm. when my daughter was... Uh, Pretty much 18 months old. Mm -hmm. So I was a single parent with an 18 month old and a three year old. That must have been hard as fuck, man. And running a business. <sighs> so it had its challenges. Um, but yeah, um, there's no such thing as. Tell me, how'd you get through that? 
You know, because that's no joke. That an eighteen-month-old, a three-year-old starting a business, and the mother had died. Yeah, I mean that on its own. There anyway. Um, there's no textbook or or any form of uh, no. dictionary or anything no. to get the answers right. Nah. So, um, long time ago, yeah, it had its challenges. Yeah, and uh, back in those days, um, my kids actually had to come with me. So I used to come to the office. Mm-hmm. Jeez. And when we were sitting at the business in Asia, yeah. uh, they'd come with me. I'd put them into uh, local school. Yeah. Um, believe it or not, my daughter. English speaking school? No, my daughter actually, believe this or not. She's 21 now, but the first language she learned to speak was Mandarin. No. Blonde hair, blue eyes, speaking Chinese. Isn't that a really hard language to learn as well, well she right? She was at Chinese nursery. Yeah. And then obviously she used to come back and sing Chinese nursery rhymes. That is insane, uh, bro. But now she doesn't. Have, she she can't remember it. Can she not? It. No. But well, my that, friend, when I lived in Marbella, my friend had his kids in a private school in Marbella, like an English private school, and they weren't picking up Spanish. Like they just weren't picking it up because when everyone around you speak English, mate, it's fucking easy. Yeah. That, when I lived in Spain, I was like, I didn't even have to learn any Spanish. Yeah. But to get his kids to learn Spanish, he took them out of that school and just put them in a Spanish school. <laughs> <laughs> That's learning on the job, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, he yeah. just took them out. He said, I need you to learn Spanish. So he just put them in a Spanish school. And then that, they either had to learn it or they were fucked. Yeah. Yeah. So you took them to Singapore, did you? Yeah, yeah. So that's, um, so yeah. I mean, m- my children uh, have been. Very Mate, that's hard. inspirational, that, by the way, just so you know. Oh, thank you. But that's inspirational. Raising a kid, raising two kids while starting a business, traveling all yeah, over the I world. Mean, uh, I mean, I look back in my 30s, and probably some of my 40s. I mean, it was focused purely on. Uh, Business and children. Yeah. Uh, and that was it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they, they're very much a part of the journey. Do you think this then is why, and you, because we've mentioned time management a couple of times, this is why, like, I imagine time management then was fucking hell. Because you, ha- you probably had to make the most of every fucking second in both things. Like, I've got limited time in the business today, so I'm only going to do the shit that drives me forward. I'm not going to. Like, there's not much time for procrastination in your life. No, it wasn't. I mean... <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Well, Especially like, then. Yeah, I mean, looking back anyway, I mean, the summer holidays uh, for the kids, they would go back to Scotland. So yeah. even though they're American... Um, and Chinese. The Chinese. All the above. <laughs> they would go back to Scotland every summer. Yeah. And that would allow me... That would be my travelling schedule. Yeah. For six weeks, then yeah. I would knock out, you know, back to Singapore, the offices, yeah. back over here, stateside. So... Um, used to cram a lot in over that kind and of I suppose in some way that was that's probably like left a lasting impression on you. Now I'm fucking getting it. I'm get I'm getting it now. My brain's ticking like that's why time management's so important to you because then you didn't have the fucking choice. No choice. Say, when I'm with the kids, I'm with the kids. When I'm working, I'm working. Yeah. And I'm not it. fucking around. Yeah, we're not fucking about. I mean yeah. even at nights, I mean it's a case of uh, when you're a single parent, you put them to bed at night. And uh, so you got to be mindful of the times they go to their bed. Yeah. You still got to get to school in the morning. Yeah. No excuses. Yeah. You got up in the morning, take them to school every morning. Yeah. So that was just a part of it. I mean, it was just a case that the situation happened and uh, we made it work mm-hmm. over those years. Mm-hmm. And you brought those lessons with you now? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, it goes back to try to stay stay humble as well. Like, that's mm. important. Mm. Um mm. Because, I mean, shit does happen when you least expect it, like. And that's the shit that keeps you humble. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that is the shit that keeps you humble. Yeah, exactly. What's the biggest challenge you've had in your business ever? People. People. Yeah, ex-business I, partners, ex-staff. If there's always ex-business partners, staff, mm. uh, big egos. Mm. Um, what, would you, what would you do different? What would I do different? Um, I what I've done now is different. Mm. I've surrounded myself with uh, like-minded people, not yes people, or yeah. yes man. Yeah. People giving them the opportunity to give a validated opinion mm. on the business, on a decision-making process. Mm. That's key. Mm. Maybe in other corporations, maybe previously in a past life with me, I just wanted them to say yes. Yeah. And uh, I never really got that. So you had of. people then that were, this is, this is again, such a great thing that you're bringing up to me here. You had people that were almost too supportive. They were, too, they were as positive as you. I made a lot of mistakes. I, like, I employed, uh, I'll use the word familiarity, meaning that uh, a lot of people who worked for me were actually people I actually liked. 
Mm. That's yeah. one of the. You know what? That's one of the things that we. Uh, I was warned about by my coach when I brought Mac in. Leslie was like, "Do you know why you like him? Because he's just like you." So that itself, um, and you can't. I don't think you can have two of you in your business, right? You can't. You can't. No, you can't. But uh, familiarity was uh, was a key ingredient, which uh, used lessons learned approach. Yeah. Um, but moving forward, anyway, having a balance of youth, yeah, and experience. Yeah. Tony Robbins says something. It might be Richard Branson. Actually, it's one of these two. Both of them live on their fucking own island, to be fair. That your success in your life is down to the, not the amount of uncertainty you can handle, which I love anyway, but how many difficult conversations that you have. Oh, yeah, I mean, you have to, certainly on my side, I've had so many difficult conversations with myself. Yeah. Because uh, I don't think anyone can say, you know when people talk about criticism, Tommy, right? You came in for your fair share of criticism. Oh, yeah. I don't think anyone can see anything about us that's worse than what we've said to ourselves. Absolutely. I mean, it, those challenges themselves anyway, for, for every uh, failure, there's a success. Every success is a failure, but yeah. you're only answerable to yourself. Yeah. You can't you can't pass the buck and say it was that guy's fault or yeah. her fault. You yeah. can take ownership of it. Yeah. And how do you go from then? Because I say this quite a lot. I'm big on personal responsibility. I think someone calls it radical responsibility, which I love as well. Um, radical responsibility, total responsibility, full responsibility. What do you think the difference then is between responsibility and kind of blaming yourself? Because I see some people, oh, well, it's my fault. Like, what's the? Have you heard that before? I've heard that now before. People do that. Oh, well, it's all my fault and I'm so this. I just don't surround with people. I don't surround with people like that, so that's yeah. something there anyway. But I know where you're coming from. Yeah. Do you ever slip into that or no, no? No. What do you do when negativity comes knocking on your door? Like uh, I have tendency. I have, you know, shared some stories where I have had that uh, two minute feel sorry for myself, but I pretty much learned to snap out of it. Yeah. Um, and that takes time. You yeah. Just be, you got to be consciously aware that you're complaining over something which really is either not important or two, it's in the past. Yeah. But it's, it's a just habit. Pr- I think, yeah, I think you're right, mate. It's I think a habit. It's just practice. It's practice, a habit. Yeah. I mean, I've been surrounded by people constantly moaning. I sometimes feel like saying to them, you know what? I'll give you $1,000 if you stop complaining <laughs> for the next three days. <laughs> do, you know, do you know me? I actually had this conversation on Friday. No, not Friday just gone, the Friday before that. And I was saying, it's funny that, you know when people say, oh, try go a day without complaining. I couldn't fucking do it. <laughs> I could, could you? Well, I don't think I could do it. We're all guilty of it. Um, but I think it's you've got to be mindful of uh, when to complain, if that makes sense. Yeah, my goal is just to complain less today than yeah. I did yesterday. Yeah. 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 And maybe it's a cultural thing. I think maybe, I don't know if it's like in the northeast England or northeast of Scotland, like to complain a lot, but that's that's a cultural thing. Yeah, and it is, it's, it's a mad thing. I, I once wrote down, um, I still remember doing it, all the things that I complain about, like verbally, mentally, and mate, the list was fucking massive. And now, do you know what was really liberating about that list? Two things happened. One, every time I complain of those thing, about those things, I have a little giggle, which is quite liberating, actually, that, like, giggling, fucking hell, there's me complaining again. Like, I find it funny. But the second thing is I actually start to have a bit more empathy for other people that complain. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you've got to be grateful for what you've got. I mean, that's what people say, like, but, I mean, uh, I, I guess I changed. When I was ill, I was a, a good day. Uh, I had my tumour in my stomach. And when you're stuck in a bed... How long were you in? Nine, nine months. Nine months I was out of uh, the picture. Like. Oh, fucking hell. All right, let's uh, let's stay here. Tell me what happened. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you just keep dropping things on me that I didn't know. Well, put it this way anyway. Uh, as a lessons learned in here. Yeah. It's called listen to your body, which I didn't. Yeah. And I was probably... Do you uh, know, I think the body's a funny thing because I'm thinking uh, your body never lies. My body gives me constant feedback. I, I know... I can tell by my weight where I'm at. I can tell by how I'm feeling where yeah. I'm at. I can tell by the fucking hairs on me. I can tell by me tan where I'm at. Like, it's amazing, the body. Yeah, I can yeah. tell by whether my underpants fold over at the top. That's me telltale sign for yeah. knowing when I need to tighten up. Yeah, sometimes we get uh, we get too much in the moment. Or what was your body telling you then? It was fatigued. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was in some form of discomfort. Mm-hmm. But when you get discomfort over a period of time, you get used to discomfort, do you? Mm. And then... Uh, just becomes normal. It comes, comes normal. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, it wasn't until that we took that kind of quantum leap yeah. to go and get checked. And uh, lo and behold, yeah. It was what was it, like pain? and? Yeah, I mean, I'd, well, I had a five-inch tumour growing in my stomach. Oh, shit. Uh, little Could I you know. see it? No, I just no. thought it was maybe like... Uh, 
Constipation. Constipation. Is, so well, you not, could you not have a shit like? I'd, I'd struggle with the shit for a while, like, but uh, <laughs> but no. My, my point being is we are quite literally talking shit. We are talking. We are talking shit. shit. But no, I'd uh, I'd end up having stinky shit because I'd a cloths me bag for six months, which oh, wasn't fun. Oh shit! So you talk about uh, anguish. Yeah. You talk about uh, mental health. Yeah. You know, t- get, getting that waking up to that in the morning. Yeah. Was a challenge on its own. Yeah. Fuck me, mate. But so uh, did you end up having to get that removed, or? Yeah, I got it removed. Yeah. Like, uh, cut out three quarters of my colon. Fucking hell. And then. Uh, Stitches they got about fifty two stitches in my stomach. Jesus Christ. Open me up and then uh give me a me bag and yeah. then wait to heal again. They open me up. Again. Where were you at this point? Texas? In Texas, yeah. So yeah, so go back to the complaining. So when you've had a lot of things. Hang on, I'm not finished with this nine month thing yet. You were in hospital for nine months. No, no, no. I was bedded. I was oh, you hosp- was bedded. Yeah, I mean he'd been cut open like a pig. Yeah. Twice. Yeah. So yeah, I mean Was it right down the middle? Right down, yeah. Oh fucking hell. Uh, the scars to shot. Shit. So nine months, were you still working then? Were you stuck in the bed? I mean, you couldn't move. So you had uh, pretty much. How did you get your head around that? Were you feeling sorry for oh, yourself then, or were you? I was. That's what I'm saying. Now yeah. I don't because I've had that part of my life which I probably complain. I was probably a horrible person to live with. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I can imagine because you're a, you're an active guy. You're a busy guy. You're a yeah. hustler. You're a doer. You're a fucking what I call a go getter. So that must have been really challenging for I you. Mean, that. You're shitting out of the bag. <laughs> Shit out back and unable to do anything. I had to do it. Yeah, I think I'd be the same. Oh, it was torture. Yeah, that was that was probably. You must have learned a lot about yourself in I that did. period. I did. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was challenging. Yeah. Probably the most uh, mental challenge I've had to endure. What were some of the lessons you got from that? It's from from a kind of personal life. Then, anyways, it's obviously uh, time is not given. Mm. So it's kind of that's important. This is uh, you know, Tommy, that thing that you've just said there. In the last probably eighteen months, I've known a lot of people that have died. Yeah, like it's mad. I don't know if it's to do with COVID or fucking vaccines or whatever, but a lot of people that are like my age have started dying. Yeah, and that's only and particularly last year. A close friend of mine died, and I've I just started thinking, "Fuck me, we haven't got forever." In fact, my friend Chris, being on the podcast actually, Chris Williamson, he posted something the other day about midlife crisis. Everyone thinks like the midlife crisis is when you're fifty, but the average American only lives until they're seventy-seven. And I'm like, fuck me, I'm past halfway through my fucking life. Yep. Which is fucking, I don't know if it's terrifying or what, but it was certainly a fucking eye-opener. Yeah, well, I'm a wee bit ahead of you. Yeah. So I'm past that stage. Yeah. yeah. It's like I'd love to live 100. Well, you never know, mate. You never know. Super Tommy Sutherland with some of the stuff that you've been through. Uh, yeah, so you learned that you didn't have, time wasn't given. What else did you good. learn about yourself? I mean, um... Obviously, my, my love for my family was important. Mm. Uh, maybe I didn't tell them as much as I, I should have done, yeah. how much it meant to me. Yeah. Um, because you don't think that you've got, you think you've got plenty of time. Aye. And in, I um, suppose in that situation, you get so caught up in your own shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so when you've got a lot of time. That's the worst pun ever. <laughs> you get so caught up in your own shit that you probably just, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, then it was a case I just, uh, I probably wasn't keeping the most healthiest of lifestyles back then. Mm. And a lot of that was probably inflicted on what your body and your body's telling your story basically, so it's all relevant. Yeah, um, it's not just a freak accident that, yeah. that that someone's grown inside you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's taking care of your, taking care of your body. I suppose your looking back at it now, there's that you, you can find a lot of like I think this is fairly easy looking back. You can find a lot of things to be grateful for for that happening. I bet sounds like it woke you up. It did woke me up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it wasn't that really that long ago either. Was it not? Um, what do you mean? Two thousand four, four years, five, five, yeah, five years ago. Fucking hell, five years ago. So yeah, shit. I think that actually, that's a, that's a. I think that our life always sends us little signals, like little alarm clocks. And I yeah. think the problem is that many of us, there's alarm clocks in our life, whether that's financially, in your relationships, in your body. But we sometimes, I think, we can be guilty of hitting fucking snooze. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think that can happen in so many areas. So I think that's a, that's a, that was a massive wake up call for you. And I think that if I wanted to wrap this up, this part up, like you've got to pay fucking attention. You got to start paying attention to your body. You've got to start paying attention to your, 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 your cash flow forecast, your balance sheets, your fucking, your relationships, your, 
your parenting skills. I think you've just got to pay attention to it. I think so many, you know, that one of the good things about being old school, Tommy, is that I bet you're not caught up in your phone too much. I'm not. I mean, I can take it or leave it. Yeah. Um, I think I've still got, I think I have an iPhone 6, so that's how important it is. Really? Like, so, uh, it's like a brick, like it works. Is it? It's slow as hell, but yeah. that, that's, that's never been a... And I suppose you're probably only using it for calls and email, I bet. That's it. Yeah, bit of WhatsApp. That's right. Bit of WhatsApp. Holy shit. Tommy, I know you're stepping into um, the world of doing a bit of coaching now because you've got so many... Um, so many gems to pass on, so much knowledge to pass on, so much experience to pass on. Like, what made you want to step into that field? I guess passion is, yeah. is, is key. Um, what I've learned over the years, I feel like an add value mm. to people. And uh, a lot of it is, is probably from mistakes I made. Yeah. Um, looking back anyway, I mean, I never had a coach uh, in my younger years. Do blokes from Scotland don't get fucking coaches, no, 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 you know no, what I mean? Goes, we it? had that in it. I think that happens still now. Yeah, yeah. It still happens now. But I think, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be me, but yeah. I would recommend anybody who's in that place in their career, call it a yeah, entrepreneur or a, a business owner, executive, yeah. Yeah. is to at least look into it because it can add value. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of fluff out there, as you well know. Mm. So I, I certainly feel I'm like very well known. Live, laugh, love. So yeah. yeah. So uh, adding value, my experience. What are some of the What are some of the benefits that you've got then, Tommy, from having a coach? I know you've you've worked with several people. You, you've been on them. Um, you've done some work with Keith Cunningham, people like that. What yeah. do, What would you say that some of the advantages of 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 having someone coach you, mentor you? What do you think some of the advantages that it gives you are? Well, I'll be. 100% honest with you, mm. uh, there's no fluff in my world, Yeah, and I think if a direct approach, I think that's key. It's important. It's very important. I mean, there's a lot of people who might engage you for the sake of engaging you. Yeah, and uh, I think I think sometimes coaches and be guilty of being a fucking cheerleader. Yeah. 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 I am suppose that's probably one of the reasons that attract you to come and work with me. Yeah, absolutely. Because I'll tell you if your email signature is pointless. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, <laughs> but actually, you came back to me, like, actually, Paul, it works for this. Yeah, but, but I think that's what you need, like, somebody to give you some honesty and again we've said this right from the start like you can't just surround yourself with yes men who 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 only support you i think sometimes you need someone to challenge you challenge is key i mean we've got a tendency to uh maybe rely on our parents for advice which which is good mm. but i feel that uh to get that kind of neutral opinion um be on business yeah i think that uh, can be a key ingredient for difference between success and failure yeah and certainly my approach it was never going to be the one to tell them how to do it yeah if i can share an experience where i've failed mm -hmm. then that should be helpful for them not to go down that rabbit hole yeah with which i've done previously yeah. i've made it yeah but as i say to you i've made uh, a number of mistakes big big money mistakes yeah someone I've, I've seen a quote recently that i love which is uh People say that you should learn from your own mistakes, but actually the best way to learn is from someone else's mistakes. Exactly. Yeah, it's a yeah. powerful thing. Yeah, we were uh, we were actually um, sitting in my office there and I actually calculated within five minutes how much mistakes I'd made over a short period of time based on impulse. And it came a magical number of 10 million US dollars. Fuck off, no <laughs> way. Do you, so, wow. Do you, even if I lose 9 million, I can still save a million. Jesus Christ, mate. So, uh, and what do you... Let's let's finish on this point. When you mean acting on impulse, do you mean like acting from the way you are feeling or... What do you mean by that? Head wasn't right, the right uh, frame of mind. Yeah. I could have been boozed up the night before. I could have been boozed up at lunchtime. Yeah. Uh, sleep deprivation. Yeah. Uh, stress, not yeah. managing it. Not angry. Not kind of angry. Angry. Oh, angry. Yeah. Very angry. Yeah. Um, Actually, I want to finish on this. I want to finish on this anger thing. How have you managed to get a handle on that? I don't get angry anymore. Yeah. All the time. Sometimes. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, I've got... How have you... What have you done to, so you're in that place then? I... Because I can imagine you getting angry. I can I imagine, like, proper Scottish anger. Yeah, but I, uh, I've i found a passion for mine, which was before boxing, is my tie. Mm. So if I've, any, if I've got any worked up aggression in me, yeah. or any element of anger in me... Yeah. It's rattled out half past six in the morning before yeah. I got the office. <laughs> 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 
Man, I love that, you know, because I don't think men, I don't think enough people talk about this. It's like, like, you should brush it. I think martial arts, any kind of martial arts is, I think it's too easy to say like, or don't get angry or hand or or like just don't get pissed off anymore. But it's kind of human nature, isn't it? It's an emotion. We can't just turn off emotions. So I think actually having an outlet for natural aggression is a fucking amazing place. For it? sure. I mean, when I was younger, my nickname was Tommy Time Bomb. For that same reason. <laughs> Tommy's just trying to serve in it because I'm going to call him that. Mate, you're getting that forever. No, it's supposed to, no, you're getting that forever. No, it's American Tommy, you remember? T Tommy, ta <laughs> Tommy the time bomb. Oh my no, God. No, no. But there's, uh, I've overcome that part. But yeah. I, Do you think at some point, though, you've used that anger to actually, like, do something useful or not? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, because uh, anger's a strange emotion. It's a high, for me, it's a high energy. Like it's a high energy state. It's just a lot of the time it's it's low in quality. Like it's a low quality state, but it's a high quantity state. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everybody's different there anyway. Yeah. I mean, I I uh, I enjoy, as you say, a martial art. I mean, yeah. a lot of people don't realize that uh, that takes time to learn. Uh, I'm still an apprentice when it comes to the world of Mai Tai. Yeah. Um, but it's a great sport. I thoroughly enjoy it. And you know, if I've got any built up aggression, then what better way to to let it loose. Yeah, I love it. Tommy Sutherland, where can the guys find more about what you're doing, what, what you're up to? Um, more about Tommy Timebomb. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you can email me. It's quite simple. Contact at tommysutherland.com and uh, the website I've got is uh, www.tommysutherland.com. Tommysutherland.com. Tommy's going to be dropping some uh, world-class content on there very soon, aren't you, Tommy? Absolutely. He's putting together some, uh, he'd be putting together some of these stories, some useful insights that he's got in business. Um, and also, if you want to see his more corporate, Tommy, uh, go on his LinkedIn. There you go. Tommy Sutherland, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Paul. Thank you. Appreciate Amazing. it. Thank you. Tommy! That was sick. Dude, I loved it, I, yeah. I loved it.